Get the union contract here, have you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a military contract, huh? Then we can. You don't have to wear one of these, uh, Mr. President. They know they let you in. Uh, without <laughs> 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 they don't uh, worry about you. Uh. <laughs> and we, we can provide a transcript if you yeah, need that's, one. Yeah, no. that's great. I uh, uh, am delighted you could do this, and I, I wanted to kind of devote this time to a single subject, this idea of peace. And I wanted to start out at the very beginning, if I could, because I think you're like me from a little Midwestern town. You probably learned in Sunday school that old uh, verse from Matthew, blessed are the peacemakers, uh, for they shall be called, I think, the children of God, yes. however it goes. Uh, was that something from your background, this idea of peace? Because you mentioned several times having been through four wars in your lifetime. Yes. Uh, I usually answer that in response to these charges that suddenly sprang up that somehow I was yeah. sitting here with a loaded gun and uh, wanting to go out and <laughs> get a war started. Uh, no, I just, uh, and I've been very conscious of the, the horror of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also, I've said that in the context that uh, defensively about our national defense and. Uh, and why we need one, and that is that as I look back, none of those wars happened because we were too strong. They weren't, we didn't, they didn't happen because we were all well armed and looking for a fight. If you remember, Roosevelt uh, was pleading uh, for this before World War II. And I think one of the uh, startling things, when I was, went to Japan on that first trip when I was still governor and Nixon oh, yeah. asked me to make a trip there for him. I heard a story very interesting. When our generals and admirals could talk to their counterparts after the war, they asked them, they said, why Pearl Harbor? You know, why would it? And the answer was pretty amazing. The Japanese said, why not? You had just had your largest war games ever in Louisiana, Louisiana maneuvers. Mm -hmm. And you had soldiers carrying wooden guns and cardboard tanks to simulate armored warfare. Mm -hmm. They said, we didn't think you'd fight. You were out of the guard by then, weren't you, or the reserve? Because you were in uh, Fort Des Moines there, didn't you? Old well, Fort no, I, I got my commission there when the 14th yes. Cavalry was stationed there. Yes. And was, no, I was a commission in the reserve, and when uh, mm -hmm. I was making a picture called Desperate Journey with Errol Flynn, when, uh, yeah. <laughs> when uh, playing an, RA, an American in the RAF, <laughs> and one morning yeah. I was greeted with a special delivery letter before I left the house, I didn't even have to open it. In red ink on the outside, it said immediate action, active duty. <laughs> and inside, it said that I would report in 14 days <laughs> to Fort Mason in San Francisco. Yeah. I see, you're out west. Yeah, so yeah. the last part of the picture, uh -huh. there were a number of scenes which, uh, in long shot, it wasn't me. It was a double, because <laughs> I, I was long gone. They, they wouldn't even let me finish the picture. But going back to those childhood days, did your mother uh, of whom, as I remember from the reading, was quite religious, so your family yes. emphasized this matter of peace because that came right after the w World War I, of course, when you were Well, I don't know up. that it was anything particular mm -hmm. of that kind, but you have to remember, I was, uh, I was about a little over seven years old when the war ended, yeah. and uh, I remember my mother taking me down, and we lived in Galesburg at that time, taking me down to Galesburg and my brother, uh, there was a troop train coming through. And uh, oh, the crowd all went down and the train stopped and, and uh, all these young soldiers were leaning out the windows and yelling and waving and everything. And, uh, and uh, I remember as a seven-year-old, I had a penny and I ran up and handed it up to uh, one of the soldiers <laughs> and asked him, you know, take it as a good luck piece. And I've often wondered, if he was lucky, it was yeah. on its way east to go overseas, uh -huh. this train, yeah. load of soldiers. But so conscious, and at that age, uh, I can understand the kids today with the nuclear talk and the nightmares, because I had them. So mm -hmm. much of the press was about uh, uh, the atrocities that were taking mm -hmm. place in Belgium. As a matter of fact, the Weekly Reader, which goes to uh, kids nowadays, they had a survey, and I think 40% of the children said the greatest thing you could do for them would be to uh, 
make a top priority uh, reducing the risk of, of nuclear war. How do you answer that? What do you say to those? Well, that's, that's my top priority. Yeah. I, I just feel, uh, and that's why I was, uh, whether they meant it or not, when the Soviet leaders, Chernenko and Gromyko, both made public statements about wanting to see the end of nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. well, that's, I just feel that, that we have to do that. You, after World War I, and there were great atrocities against civilians and so mm -hmm. forth, in Geneva, all sorts of rules were made about war and the rules of war and the protection of civilians, that you didn't make war mm -hmm. on civilians. And here we are, all these years later, uh, in which the principal weapon on both sides is a weapon that is designed mainly to kill millions of civilians mm -hmm. with no discrimination, men, women, and children. And how, how do we think that we're more civilized today to have these and to say that, well, our, our peacemaking policy is based on the threat that if they mm -hmm. kill our people, we'll kill theirs. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd be wise if we started getting back to the point that if there has to be a conflict sometime, there are rules mm -hmm. of warfare that apply uh, that mm -hmm. you don't... Well, isn't it significant that in Afghanistan, the somewhat numerous Russian uh, deserters, and they don't, it isn't a concocted thing because they're not even in the same place, but when they're asked why they deserted, mm -hmm. over and over again they're getting an answer that these young men say they were told to kill women and children. And they deserted rather than do this. And this is in a country that has banned religion. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, Richard Nixon, I think, in his first inaugural said that uh, the greatest honor that a nation could bestow on anyone was the title of peacemaker. Uh, is, that, uh, is that your objective no, in the last four years? No, I didn't, I didn't think about it. But in World War II, uh, I was in, in the service for more than four years. I never heard a shot fired in anchor. Mm -hmm. I was a tagged limited service because of my vision, and I wound up flying a desk for the Air Force mm -hmm. and uh, brought every desk in at 5 o'clock for a safe landing. <laughs> you got them all down. <laughs> yeah. huh? But uh, at the same time, though, we, uh, our post happened to be directly under Air Force intelligence. Mm -hmm. We weren't under any intermediate command. Mm -hmm. And we trained and sent out the combat camera crews with all the bomber groups. So. As adjutant of that post, uh, there were a number of occasions when I had to phone parents, yeah. and tell them that their or wives, that their men had been killed in some of these engagements and all. And at the same time, we got all the uh, intelligence reports mm -hmm. that came over my desk as adjutant, and I used to stick them under the blotter so that at the end of the day I could really go through them. And and they contained not just routine intelligence things, they contained stories of things that were going on, unusual incidents, mm -hmm. heroic things that had taken place. And you just, even without seeing it, well, the other thing I should add that dramatized it was we also got from all the branches of the service their film, film mm -hmm. and we put together uh, a top secret report for the general staff in Washington. And you had it from all over. And uh, it spared you nothing. Yeah. This was combat yeah. film. Combat and you saw film. all that was. And you just, you came out with one feeling and one only. This must never happen yeah. again. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular presidents, presidents or others that you admire in that role of peacemaker from history, from your? either your life as you observed it or read about it? Well, I've, I've tried to think of that. I really can't mm -hmm. think. I know that some sincerely have tried, mm -hmm. but in a wrong way, such as Woodrow Wilson's watchful waiting policy. The election slogan for the second campaign was he kept us out of war. Mm -hmm. But it was a policy that took so much uh, from enemy acts and our own ships being sunk and so forth, finally the Lusitania, mm -hmm. that we realized that maybe we got in that war because 
that policy was one that made the enemy think they could do anything and we wouldn't fight. Yeah. And then finally, they, you're pushed beyond that certain point. Okay. I think that Ike uh, brought about the armistice in Korea, and he did it with mm -hmm. a quiet little leak that uh, just we might consider uh, a change in weaponry. Yeah meaning we might <laughs> loose that thing we had loosed once before. And that <laughs> almost overnight, uh, we, we went to an armistice table. Uh, well, you I, came in, of course, with the gunslinger image, you know. I yeah. don't know whether it was from your Hollywood background or, or your, your political philosophy, but uh, uh, a lot of people, I guess, still do. Uh, suggest that that makes peace very difficult because but of you know, the thing is I think really that came about mm -hmm. just out of political talk because mm -hmm. I had criticized the mm -hmm. SALT II treaty yeah. and good lord a Democrat Senate refused to ratify it mm -hmm. so uh, I wasn't alone out there but I also over and over again said that my criticism of many of the agreements before had been that they simply limited the rate of increase in the weapons mm -hmm. and that I wanted and would sit at a table as long as it took to get a decrease. That the only arms re program shouldn't be arms control, it should be arms reduction. Mm -hmm. Now I said that over and over in the campaign, but I also said that the way to get there was to refurbish our military, that we had unilaterally disarmed so over the years that there wasn't any reason for the Soviet Union to give in. When, you know, when, when we would cancel a whole weapon system that had formally been approved, the B-1, for example, what did the Russians think? Why should they go to a table and give up something? Now, I've often said if that particular weapon was not useful and that there was some reason for not mm -hmm. having it, well, then why don't you go to the negotiating table and see what the other side will give up for. Mm -hmm. Why did they sit, come back to Geneva in your judgment? Principal reason or reasons? I think because we are showing a determination to maintain a national defense policy. Uh, they hadn't seen that before. And uh, I think they knew that we were looking at them realistically, and then I think the, the crowning thing was um, our going forward with research to see if there was a defensive weapon. Once again, what you've been missiles. emphasizing all through this talk, the strength. Yes. Strength. The idea yeah. that uh, uh, the, the, the only alternative is to sit down and, and, and talk about it. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, and it's got to, if we're going to have any, and, and we have to live in the world together, Gramico sat where you were sitting, and I told him that we didn't like each other's systems, we didn't like theirs, and they don't like ours, and uh, we're not going to change each other. Paul Nitzes said the other day, or wrote, he said, they have a different idea of peace than we do. They, their idea, he said, Americans don't understand their idea of peace. Their idea is that you don't have war, but you contend on every other fr mm -hmm. frontier you can yes. for advantage over the other. Yes. You, is that the way Yes, you and it? I think this great buildup of theirs, particularly mm -hmm. in the nuclear weapons, is because they don't want war any more than we do. They want to win without war. Mm -hmm. In other words, win by being able to say to the other fellow, do you want to give up or die? Mm -hmm. And the only practical way to negotiate is to show them that it is as much to their advantage as it is to ours to get along at peace. Some uh, people have described peace as, as the absence of war. Under that definition, we've got it. You want more yeah. than that, I take, take it. Uh, well, abs yes, because I want to see the absence of a threat of war. Absolutely. And I don't want to see us, when you, when you sit here with as many nuclear weapons uh, as both sides have, and they have more than we do. Mm -hmm. I heard one of your shows the other night where some of your compatriots on the show were uh, <laughs> talking about us and we've got enough to kill them over and over again and so forth. Uh, you're getting to, 
I, I always wait for the camera to go to you because you're the only one that seems to <laughs> indicate that maybe there are things they don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, they can't add those other fellows. I don't yes. know. <laughs> but the, the, the risk mm -hmm. is so great of something not planned, let's say, directly between the two, but you suddenly find yourself in a confrontation. Mm -hmm. And then you say, is, you know, how easy it would be for someone to take that step Mm -hmm. and use nuclear weapons. And I think that's the end of the world as we know it, if they yeah. do. Well, should we have a generation growing up that from childhood on has got to face this and say, we live in this kind of a world that in mm -hmm. 20 minutes, mm -hmm. somebody could be wiping us out. And I think the answer to it is, rather than a, a defense of a mutual or assured destruction, that we, we get rid of them. That bothers you a lot, doesn't it? That yes. idea that you, that it's There's founded something. on this notion yeah. that you kill each, you There's threaten something. each other. Yeah. There's something so so immoral about it mm -hmm. that uh, think if you're you're sitting at that desk, mm -hmm. and uh, the word comes that the other side that they're on their way, mm -hmm. and you sit here knowing that. There is no way at present of stopping them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to blow up mm -hmm. how much of this country we can only guess at. Mm -hmm. And that your only response can be to push the button before they get here so that even though you're all going to die, they're going to die too. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. What's the most heartening thing that happened in your first four years for peace, do you think? Oh, there have been a lot of things, but I think the really one is to see the return of America to what it once was, people that are optimistic, people that believe in the country again, that are proud of it. During the campaign, I've never seen so many flags before. I've been in several campaigns, state level and otherwise before this, but and the, the flag companies say that uh, They've never sold so many flags as they have. And it really came to a point, a critical point for me, in the appearances out there on campuses to see the young people. When I was governor, you know, if I went to a campus, I, I'd already been burned yeah. in effigy, and, and then they'd try to do it for real. But that sense of nation and patriotism yes. underlies peace again. You're, you're and the, the morale, the esprit yeah. de corps of the services. Yeah. Remember, four years ago, people were saying that the volunteer military was a failure, that we'd have to go back to the draft and force them in. Mm -hmm. Well, I never wanted that, never believed in it for peacetime. And here we have a volunteer military and the, as I say, the morale of the, the patriotism, mm -hmm. the dedication of these young men and women that are in service is just so thrilling. Mm -hmm. Do you get any special signals from Moscow? I know you write now and then to whomever is over there yeah. in charge, and I just wondered if there is, besides what we saw from Mr. Schultz over in Geneva, if there's anything other that indicates uh, well, some more hope here. Well, that, it culminated in the Geneva yes. meeting. The, the fact when, when Grimmick was here, the fact that, first of all, that he mm. accepted the invitation and came, it was not a meeting of storm and mm -hmm. him uh, shouting any imprecations at us. Uh, and uh, I was convinced that, that we had made, mm -hmm. we'd made some headway in the, uh, uh, when he was here. And uh, yes, then when Chernenko went public with a mm -hmm. statement that he would like to see the elimination of nuclear weapons, uh, I think all of these were, were signals. And the very fact that the meeting was held. But nothing private, special, nothing... Well, their, their letters exchanged, yes. Mm -hmm. I always feel constrained about uh, discussing them because sure, I, I feel that uh, yeah. they, they, they might... Uh, gentlemen take it. don't read other gentlemen. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> we don't do that. Is there a chance of a summit meeting with, again, whoever is in charge over there? At, that, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, again, I just have to say that if there's always been a chance, and as far as I'm concerned, except uh, I don't think there'd be any point in just having a get acquainted mm -hmm. meeting. I think that you've got to really have something where 
some progress can be made mm -hmm. and uh, an agenda that's been very carefully planned and I think they feel that same way too. They have, they have remarked about mm -hmm. uh, publicly that there must be a practical agenda for such a meeting. You know, you said some harsh things a while back about the Soviets, and they said even more harsh things about you. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't bother you to, to, to talk with them now. I mean, no, you accept I think that, that as part of the game? I think all of those served a purpose. I think that mm -hmm. I had a very definite feeling when I came here that they had to understand that we were seeing them realistically. Too many times in the past we've dealt with them on a mirror image basis that, well, gee, they're just like us. and if if they see that we're nice, why well, they'll be nice too. And uh, I thought it was time that some, that uh, I, I believe until they prove otherwise that they do have uh, expansionist ideas. So you're still a, a, an enthusiast about your original idea. You haven't changed that, that uh, no. through strength and, uh, and wise use of it comes the greatest chance for peace. And yes, and the one thing, as I say, that if they recognize that it is, uh, it has to be a good deal for them too, they have to look yeah. and see that they would be better off uh, than they would trying to engage in an endless arm race with us. Would you uh, like to go to the Soviet Union and just see the people there? Have you been? Uh, no, I've mm -hmm. never been there and looking out the window at all this snow. <laughs> I um, think you're there right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I'd, I'd rather pick a, uh -huh. a, a better place. I, for the moment, I mean, yeah, it's like but, the Bahamas. Uh, or <laughs> yeah, I see. I see. I see. Uh, Mr. President, you know that yeah. line you've always talked about. You'd like to talk to their people and let him see what our oh. people. That, you know, that's always uh, been a good thought. You've had. Yes, I've often thought if we. You know, I don't think that the people of either country would ever start a war. Mm -hmm. Governments start wars. And I've often uh, thought, I, I know when I'm in the helicopter here and going over many of our cities and like in the campaign and you're looking down and you know, being an American, you're looking down at the homes of the rank and file working people of America. And you see that car and trailer with a boat on it and the driveway of a car house mm -hmm. and another one's got a yeah. swimming pool in the backyard and so forth. And I have a fantasy of, if you could only have the helicopter filled with some of those people in the Politburo, mm -hmm. and then say, look, uh, mm -hmm. this is no pre-planned -pre route. You tell us where you want to mm -hmm. go and what you want to look at, and then tell them, those are, those are where our working people live. Mm -hmm. None of those concrete rabbit hutches that they, yeah. <laughs> that they have yeah. over there. I remember one time we were flying out Illinois, yeah. probably, to make a speech during the campaign in, in the helicopter. And, there were those fields below us in the farmhouses, oh. and it was the most golden and green, mm -hmm. every color you could imagine of the, of the grain yeah. growing and so forth. Yeah. You said it, you could see that. That's uh, our farming. That's, yeah. Those are an all individually owned. That isn't a state farm mm -hmm. down there. And he said, I wish I could choke him into sure. this. We were yeah. just talking about me. Well, some scientists, you know, who form groups and others who talk about nuclear weapons and have written papers on the threat claim that, contrary to what you suggest, that we are closer to World War III and that you've uh, upset the, uh, uh, the progress that had been made before. How do you answer those people? Well, I answer them to look at the record now. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they are still in Afghanistan, but they haven't started any new operations mm -hmm. anyplace. They haven't taken over any new territories. And uh, they're back uh, wanting to talk. And. Uh, I, we must have been doing something right <laughs> to have these exchanges. I just saw our ambassador off to Stockholm, who's for the continuation there with the Eastern Bloc and the others, the whole thing about peace in Europe, uh, that they're still negotiating and talking. And uh, all of the Eastern Bloc nations are represented there too. And uh, the talks are still going on and they're contributing uh, just mm -hmm. as the Western nations are. Uh, I just, uh, no, I have to think that, that we've, uh, that what we've done, remember that they, after World War II, they have to have a pretty healthy respect for our technology mm -hmm. and our industrial might. 
And up until now, they've seen that they could just sit, as I said earlier, and uh, we didn't do anything about matching their, their buildup. But I think it's all summed up in a cartoon the other day, some time ago, with our buildup, mil military buildup now. And that was the cartoon of the two Russian generals talking, and the one of them said, I liked it better when we were the only one in the arms race. <laughs> now, with that respect, there must come a pause when they say to themselves, if this is what it's going to be, and if we're going to continue on our side over here, is there going to be a point where they fall behind? They've been behind once when mm -hmm. we were the only ones that had the weapon. They didn't like it. Mm -hmm. so, Why are they so upset about your idea in Star Wars? Does that relate to that, our technology? Yes, I, th I think it does. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, all we're doing is re research. And if they really mean it about wanting to eliminate the threat of these weapons, uh, if, we c if research mm -hmm. can bring us uh, the idea of a weapon mm -hmm. that makes these others obsolete, mm -hmm. then it's good for them and good for us. And no way, if we come up with that and find that it can be done, there's no way that I would say that we should sit here with our missiles and that weapon and then have them able to suspect that we might be planning a first strike because we have a defensive weapon. I would say that once you've got the knowledge of the weapon, that's when you go public mm -hmm. and sit down with them and say, now, mm -hmm. you know, what are we going to do? I wish that they'd go forward with the same thing themselves. Mm -hmm. Because if both of us knew that we could stop the other fellow's missiles, we wouldn't have to have them anymore. You remember that back a few months ago when somebody said, because of you, discussion of Armageddon with one of your pastors in the, in the <laughs> way back there that you, you sh wouldn't have your heart in this business. <laughs> but I did, never did say, see whether you answered that. Uh, well, uh, the thing is, okay. I have a couple of times, and, and this had to have come from somebody talking mm -hmm. out of school. Not seriously, but talking sometimes. I've pointed out that some years ago, uh, mm -hmm. I got interested in this from something that was told me uh, by a well-known clergyman. Well, I, you know, I've been raised going to Sunday school. I know about the prophecies of Armageddon, mm -hmm. and it does take place in the Middle East and so forth. But um, this clergyman had met with Adenauer and was surprised to learn that Adenauer, one of his kind of hobbies was uh, uh, a theology. He was mm -hmm. a very well-informed theologian. Mm -hmm. And he brought the subject up to this clergyman, American clergyman, about the prophecies of the Old Testament seeming to come becoming uh, together in this particular era. Well, I'm going back to his time. And uh, sometimes something will happen, but it's been as casual as this. Somebody bring up the, the unusual weather that, you know, hasn't happened for a hundred years or something of this kind. And uh, knowing of the old prophecies, I would say, well, you know, that was one of the prophecies that there would be great natural disasters <laughs> in the world <laughs> and storms and so forth. And uh, whoever got this idea out that I was guided by Armageddon, uh, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Just one of those uh, discussions uh, yeah. that people go through Bull about religion type of things, and their yeah. philosophy yeah. and that sort of thing. It doesn't enter into your concerns. Lord, no. Do you, uh, I guess you're signaling we yeah. got to go, huh? Uh, do you look like, does you, do you anticipate, Mr. President, you're going to spend more time on this peace issue? Is that going to consume more of your uh, working hours in this next term? Well, it's, you know, there's an awful lot of time already mm -hmm. that's been spent. Mm -hmm. Things of this kind, uh, that's a very large part of this job. And, uh, but does that become more special than it was? Oh, well, I think there will be far more concentration now yeah. because you will be, once the negotiations mm -hmm. actually start, you will be in constant communication mm -hmm. about uh, what's being said and decisions will be have, to, have to be made about uh, what is a fair trade or not. I just, my one principle about them is that we will not send negotiators over there and say, you know, at whatever price, get an agreement. No, no hat in hand it's got to be a good agreement that's beneficial mm -hmm. to both sides and to the cause of peace. Mm -hmm. I see. And they'll, 
they'll know that if that's impossible, uh, uh, they'll walk away before they sign a bad agreement. What are your chances of being remembered as a peacemaker in these next four years? Well, I have to hope that, <laughs> that they'd be pretty good because mm -hmm. the alternative is so terrible to think of. Great. Good. Yeah. Mr. President, that's terrific. Uh, that's wonderful. I appreciate it. And uh, get you off to a good start here with the inaugural. Are you all set for that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I'm... <laughs> George and I were both wishing that maybe 